So welcome everybody to the Love is Action Community Initiative. And we are a national organization, sometimes international. Um, and we invite anybody from their communities to bring together stakeholders. And we want to assist mainly children and families in distress. And wow, <laughs> in COVID times, I think that could be everybody, right? And so our, our goal is always sharing love um, in our communities by action and small impacts having ripple effects within our communities, but within our country and our cultures. So today we get to share um, good works. And I just, I love the opportunity of having both Scott and Colette here today from their program and to get to talk about how you guys work with youth and adults that maybe haven't been in the workforce or and how to provide um, success, if you will. And I'd love to know your interpretation of that word and how the community is impacting it, um, where you're at. So we'd love for you to tell us who you are, where you're from, and um, maybe giving us some tips of what we can do at the end in our communities in correlation to what you guys do. So mm. I'd love for you to take it away. Yeah, right on. Thank you, Amber. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can answer answer those questions and and hopefully give some insights into what we've learned in in our what is now a, our six year journey. Um, so I'll go a little bit about uh, how how I got here, um, and then I'll let Colette talk a little bit about how how she came in and and really the role that she's played um, with us over the last couple of years. And then I think we want to talk about what our what the workforce development, um, like the iteration, um, has come through. Because we one of the things that uh, you'll hear hopefully probably throughout our our conversation um, is that we we fail fast um, and we learn from those failures and and really um, kind of move ourselves forward to to the next level. And and that's I, I think it's a testament to to our organization and testament to the folks um, and that we are constantly looking for uh, for better better outcomes, right? The, the definition of success, um, certainly when we're working with, with human beings, um, kind of moves, moves a little bit. And, and, what, we, and what we've defined as success um, has changed really over the years. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, and I think that's a good place for me to jump off. Um, I come from the corporate world. Um, my whole background has, has been in, in business. Um, I've worked for big uh, corporate companies, um, I've worked for privately held companies. I've, I've had a few of my own companies, um, but it was, and I was running a, uh, a all in packaging, all in supply chain, uh, which is all the talk today. So I'm really glad I'm not in the supply chain world anymore. Um, and, uh, but the, uh, my, my wife volunteered as a CASA um, about 12 years ago now. And it was really through her experiences as a CASA that I became aware of um, the challenges within the foster care community. Um, and, and up until really that point, we had been, um, we'd been donors, we'd, we'd, we'd supported organizations that were working with uh, single mothers or, or youth that were at risk and feeling that we were accomplishing what we needed to do. Um, and then through her experience, and, and she was actually working with a young lady who was soon to be 18, in age out. And I asked that question to her, well, what happens when she ages out? And uh, as you guys all know, the response came back that, you know, 50% and, and that's that, that, that horrific statistic. Um, I looked at her and told her that there was zero chance that that was true, uh, must be closer to 15%, not 50, or we should be someone standing on a desk in Sacramento um, telling folks that we're, we're failing our children. And um, it, my wife uh, is much more loving and patient than I am. And so she said, well, look it up and, and do the research. Um, and that's really when I became aware and started to understand that the challenges um, for that were you know, for youth and, and folks that were impacted, young people that were impacted by the foster care system. Um, and uh, put it on my heart. That was, that was something that we needed to do. Um, I was literally... 24 hours from then driving to go uh, to the next, to the company that I was running at the time. And um, God put it on my heart that the time was now. And uh, so I had a, a quick discussion um, with what now meant. Um, his definition of now and my definition of now were, were um, a little off kilter. Um, he meant now. Um, I meant when I was ready. Um, so he won. 
And uh, I literally, uh, I, I went in probably within, again, later that week and tendered my resignation, uh, told the ownership that I uh, was going to go do something um, to help change the outcomes for youth that were coming from the foster care system. And they asked great questions like, well, what does that mean? And what are you going to do? And, and I was solidly uh, um, answered, I have no idea, um, but it's what I'm supposed to do. And so that's what I'm going to go make happen. So I love I that. <laughs> it's not Scott, I just want to acknowledge everybody's facial expressions on Zoom for a minute here is because I suspect a lot of us have been in that moment or maybe listeners have experienced that moment. And so it kind of gives me even more excitement to hear how you went from this aha epiphany moment of uh, refu and then refusal <laughs> inside <laughs> to the amazing action of the program. So I just yeah. wanted to note that that that's totally relatable when we're coming to <laughs> great love in our community. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and honestly, it's one of, one of the reasons that I love so much what, what you guys are doing and, and love is action, right? It's the action component. It's the works component um, that is sometimes the, the biggest challenge. Um, so um, because we can talk about it, we can have conversations, but unless we're, unless we're eyeball to eyeball and, and knee deep in it, um, it's really hard to, to understand how we, we best serve our communities. Um, so, so that was, you know, like I said, I had this great grandiose plan that was, um, I, uh, full of, I don't knows, um, it was just to, to listen loudly and, and move forward. And so, um, as we, um, kind of looked at, uh, from a very high level, what I identified or thought that the challenges were for, for youth, um, that were emancipating, um, was really a lack of education. So education, um, concerns as well as, um, uh, workforce or, 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 or employment concerns, right? And uh, I have no idea how to address the education system, but because of my background in supply chain and a lot of the work that we had done in our, I, I knew lots of folks that hired uh, temporary employees. It was not glamorous work, but I knew folks, we could hire a thousand young people at any given time. Um, so I'm like, great, I'm, we're gonna start off as, and we, the company actually started as a staffing agency. Um, with the idea that we would connect young people that needed jobs with those employers that I knew in the community that would be willing to hire. And um, I, I took that honestly all the way up through Walmart um, and, and suggested that the idea was, hey, you know, you need these, this work done with these different community partners. Um, we're going to bring foster community to this workforce. And here's how you're going to create change. Um, that was also met with a resounding no, um, because then, then, and again, I, I'm speaking to folks that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, I, I got the not not those kids, um, and and so that is another motivating factor to what where we sit today, and the and the the satisfaction that I get um, is because this organization, our success, and what you're going to continue to hear about um, is built not for but through those kids. And, and it, is, it is absolutely incredible. Um, and I, again, I use that term, those kids, what they bring to the community and how they are, the, the resilience that they bring and the quality that it, and again, as we, as we talk about what we're doing and what we've experienced and what we are seeing um, even as of yesterday, um, the impacts and how we're, we're kind of bringing, bringing this um, opportunity to them and with them, um, it's, it's, it's outstanding. So, so that's the background. Um, so, so we you know, so it started with the employment side. Um, so we, 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 scrapped, we scrapped the staffing model um, because really all that that allowed us, to, we ran into you know, other real world problems like how do I get transportation? How do I, you know, what do we do about living situations? What do we do about... Um, mental health, right? Their ability to understand how to be a good employee. Um, all of those things that we really started to, um, I started to learn only because we were in conversation and at, at the interview table with them, talking with them and, and again, learning those experiences through, through real life. And, and that was invaluable, right? So we had a really great model that had zero chance of working. Um, in order to change outcomes, right? We could get kids jobs, but as you know, right, about a week and a half later, we would see the same kids looking for another first job. 
And I tried to understand what that cycle is and why that cycle continued. And that was something, again, historical outcomes. Um, so, okay, what is that? Why, why, what? And as, again, as you guys might know, I mean, that was, that led us into the path of understanding mental health. The challenges of, of uh, now today, right? We are a trauma informed company um, and we, and I'm probably the world's large, well, not the world's, but I mean, as far as what I've learned, what personally and professionally is that we need to be leading with, with trauma informed action, right? It, it, it can, we, and, and I don't care whether we're in the, in the social space or we're in the business space or we're in life space, um, what that allows us to do that the empathy that that allows us to come at a convert, come into a conversation with, um, and understand where that person is coming from the what has happened to um honestly it's 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 the culture component that is missing in most corporations that they're all searching for so i spend mo a lot of my time off hours with the guys that are still in the corporate world explaining the value of being trauma informed personally professionally but organizationally and what that brings to the market and so there's some real value. And again, that's maybe a, a quick uh, amber to your, you know, what does success look like or what types of things can we be doing in the community? Uh, I think it all has to start from that trauma lens in everything that we put together, regardless of what, what we're bringing to the marketplace, whether it's workforce development, whether, you know, any, any number of things that really, um, the more and more that I become exposed to it and learn more and go deeper in that understanding, um, it is, it's the number one component um, of, of how we then define success, right? So even going back to what does success for us look like? Um, ultimately, that is helping, helping our humans become healthier and happier. And along the way, right, that, that, that's key. And it's, you know, sometimes it's job stuff, sometimes it's employment stuff, but if they, if they can become ultimately a little more a little stronger in their growth mindset <clears throat> and how they, and how they are able to perceive and see themselves and see the world around them and interact with all those things. That's success. Sometimes it comes with employment opportunities. Sometimes it doesn't, but that's, that's what, where we're starting to define the, uh, even the finish line, but a success line. That's awesome. I love how it's um, very inclusive and, that way it can be identified to particular needs of, of those that you work with. So can you tell us a little bit of what your organization specifically is? So if this was for some of these listeners who have, this is the first time they're learning about it and we have yeah. kind of the framework of it. Yeah. Now tell us what it is. That's awesome. Okay. So, so let me give you that and then I'll turn it over to Colette and give, give a little bit about that. So we're, we're in the promotional swag business, right? Um, I tell people we're, we're swag with purpose. Um, so anything that is branded, anything with a logo, um, anything from corporate wear to pens to you name it, if it's got a brand or a logo on it, um, that's, that's what we do um, as doing good works. Um, the reason we chose that business was it was a couple, we, as we looked at social enterprise um, industries, um, there were lots of blue collar things, a lot of folks that are doing screen print businesses and other things, we wanted to to leverage technology. Um, and we also wanted to leverage the expertise that was in the marketplace and, and allow those manufacturers to do what they did really well and then connect with businesses in the local community and get them excited about how they could use their marketing dollars that were already established and repurpose those. And what we talk about is turning that transaction into a transformation. So that's the baseline of the business. Um, we have a hiring model. We have an operating model that's uh, 10, 20, 30. Uh, so 10% of our corporate profits go back into investing into um, uh, foster care programs that we think are um, unique or interesting or creating um, unique outcomes. Um, so we want to invest into those programs. And that's 10 to 10%, uh, 20% of our, our employees' time are, are set aside. Um, at least we'd like to think so, um, is set aside for um, mentoring and, and volunteering and spending time within the community. Um, and I'll, again, I'll let Colette talk about our internship program that, uh, that she established a couple of years ago. Um, but that's, we want to be very intentional about how our employees 
are spending their time, right? And if we don't create space, then we just become busy. And so that's the, our 20%. And then the 30% um, is our commitment to the foster community that we will always have 30% of our entire employee population will come directly from the foster care system. And today we're running ahead of that. I think we're at 45%. Um, and we've the exciting, the exciting thing that we're going to announce to you guys today um, is the new model that really is almost a 90, 90% workforce development model um, called Purpose Printery, which is going to be very similar in its approach to the marketplace, the same kinds of products, but it will be a community-based um, business that hires directly from the foster care system to do intentional training, workforce development and, and business operations and allows us to mentor. And they will, be a, they will be a vendor, a supplier to what is doing good works, which is we're, re, we're renaming DGW branded. Awesome. And so, is that, so anyway, let me, you know, that's, that's, that's the business. Scott, can you tell me that name again? I'm just trying to type some notes on the side yeah. for anybody who references this. So I just need the name again, please. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a uh, purpose printery. Thank you. And we, yeah, we, we, we work together we, uh, with a group here, OC United, um, that has a housing program for foster community in, in Southern California. Um, we actually moved some of our equipment um, into their facility, um, trained a couple of young ladies that on UV equipment. So we get orders from Johnson and Johnson on name badges and other corporations and taught them how to use the equipment and how to use the technology to download orders. Um, and they actually named it Purpose Printery. Um, and so we, uh, we've allowed them the naming rights. And uh, like I said, it is going to be to some degree, uh, say a franchise type of concept, but multiple geographies in the community where we can bring youth teach them skills, work alongside of them, pour into them, um, and then give them a transferable skill um, that they can take out to the marketplace. So we are excited about that. So enough, awesome. thank you. Uh, uh, we are, as I said, super excited because we've had the opportunity to do lots of proof of concept. Um, and like I said, it sounds much more buttoned up um, in this half hour presentation than, than what it's been. It's been a six year journey. Um, Colette's been with us now three years, Colette. Two, I think. Maybe. Two, I think yeah. Two. yeah. Um, and, and again, so I'm going to turn over to Colette, who, who again, I'll let her tell that story. But uh, she, she joined through faith um, and has done an amazing job of, of really bringing what I've just hopefully encapsulated in, into the, the, what we can pour into the youth and how we approach um, how we approach the business model. So Colette, I'll turn it to you. Awesome, thanks. Um, well, hello everyone, happy happy to be here and share with you today. And um, I'll just give a little quick, just my background and then talk a little bit through the evolution of how we got to where we are with this uh, direction we're going with Purpose Printery. Um, so I came from the similar to Scott, a very like corporate-y world, I worked for a technology startup. We got acquired by ADP, the huge payroll company. Um, and I was a product manager. So I worked in tech um, and I knew that I wanted to um, get into the social entrepreneurship space. Um, and so didn't really know how to navigate it. Went back, uh, got my master's. Um, and um, at the same time that I graduated, it was kind of one of those also leap of faith things where I just knew that um, although like the whole corporate world seemed like a, you know, good plan. Um, at the same time, it just wasn't, it didn't feel right. Um, and so I knew that there was another direction I was being pulled in. Um, I um, got involved with a group down um, Royal Family, for those of you who are familiar. Um, they do summer camps for kids in foster care. They do mentoring. Um, and a close family friend for a long time had been kind of like encouraging me to do that. Um, and right at the same time was when I got connected with doing good work. Um, and so Everything kind of just fell into place all within a matter of a couple months. Um, and I started um, with doing good works, um, leading our Foster Greatness initiative. Um, and Foster Greatness is really um, 
the side of the business that really focuses on changing outcomes. And I think everything we do focuses on that. Um, but that's like mission first, um, leading with the mission. And so um, as you're all familiar now, we do a lot of that through employment. Um, and so um, a couple of different approaches that we've taken. Um, the one big thing that I think we've learned over time and that we also, um, I, I want to say do differently, although I know a lot of groups do um, um, look at things very holistically. So we use this um, concept called the eight life domains. Um, and so just like Scott had mentioned, um, getting a job is great, but there's life happening. And so when mental health things happen, when there's crisis going on, um, sometimes it's just not realistic. That's not where I am supposed to be at this certain time. And so we use these eight life domains um, as a conversation and kind of almost scaffolding. Um, so um, basically domains are things like education, um, employment, relationships, housing, life skills. Um, so we've eight of those different parts of life. What I think is super cool is that everyone needs eight life domains. It's not just for the foster kids, it is for all of us. And so it's the language that we use in our company. Um, it's just part of our DNA. Um, but it helps to give, um, basically fill in the gaps on areas where we might be either struggling areas that are new to us and maybe growing in. Um, so when someone starts working with us, uh, we go through all those eight life domains. Uh, we have a mentor program that's a little bit more structured, um, and they can really get involved through that mentor program, or it could just be off the cuff because we talk about these things all the time. Um, but what happens when... Um, I'm moving and I don't, I don't know where I'm going next. How do we bring in that support? Um, what happens when I get that job and I'm getting a paycheck now and that's cool, but I, no one's ever taught me what to do with that money. Um, and so we're bringing, basically rallying the community around these eight life domains. Um, we are fully aware that we are not the experts in all eight of these domains and we don't intend to be at all. Um, that's not our expertise, um, but we do want to bring um, the people that are experts in. Um, and so I'll just give a quick example of that. Um, we have a group we work with, they're called uh, Spring Financial. Um, and Spring Financial does one-on-one -on -one financial coaching and it's an employee benefit. Um, they didn't really specifically work with people who experience foster care, that's not their purpose. But we say you guys have a really valuable mission. Uh, we see huge value in what they do. Well, what if we connected the work that they do with people who did experience foster care, um, which is what we're doing. So they're our financial expert. Um, the young people that we work with have access to their budgeting tools. They can set up a one-on-one -on -one phone call. So it works really nicely because someone might be trying to save up um, for a big purchase while someone else might be working on budgeting. And it's not a one size fits all need. Um, and so that's just one example of different ways in those um, domains that we want to bring in our partners. Um, and so I, I say all of that because that is basically the backbone behind what we're doing. Um, even if it's a job, there's the domain component behind that. Um, and it's a huge, huge part of what we believe works in addition to being trauma informed and in how we operate. Um, and so when I was when I joined a couple of years ago, um, I really joined and they had a mission ambassador program. And that was um, a, hey, we, we sell swag. We've hired people on college campuses who are in guardian scholars or whatever those programs are. Um, the statistics, we know that 3% of people who experience foster care graduate college. And so the fact that you're on a college campus is incredible. Like these are rock stars. Um, and so we're connecting these young people saying, your college is buying a bunch of stuff. Why don't you help us sell it? Um, and we learned a ton. Um, we still have actually two of those mission ambassadors are now working for us in different roles full time. Um, they've graduated and are still connected, kind of growing in different ways, which has been awesome to see. Um, and I think there, it was basically, as Scott said, everything for us is a learning opportunity. Um, there, we saw we needed more structure, basically. Um, we wanted more structure and we wanted both in what they were doing and in the time commitment um, that they had. With schools are very, we have a fall semester and then a break and a spring semester and then a break. And so sometimes life needs to mirror that a little bit at that phase 
Um, and so we then transitioned into an internship program. Um, we did this during COVID, so everything was remote. Um, I think one of my favorite stories to tell that really shares a lot about doing good works um, and how we do things, how we make decisions. Um, we had a plan to bring five interns on. Um, we'd never really run an intern program, definitely never did anything remotely. Um, we had 18 apply and said, all right, let's hire all 18. Um, and so last fall, we had uh, 18 interns all remotely, all working different schedules. Um, but it was an amazing experience. Um, we're still connected to them. I've been having phone calls with them a lot recently. Um, and again, we learned a ton. I think the biggest thing that we learned was that the environment that we created, um, it translates even virtually. Um, people really felt connected to this organization that they'd never stepped in, uh, never even met us in person. Um, and I mean, the fact that they're still connected to us to this day, I think says a lot about that. Um, again, I think when we're working um, with this population, we know that structure is super important. And this was another reminder, like, more structure and they were even asking for it you know even without knowing they were asking for structure so um we put in even more guidelines just around like these are the hours these are the tasks but ultimately they are our team to help us understand what's going on in the world of foster care we had um 18 of them each of them had a different state and they were researching how does foster care work in the state um they were the experts um so that they could come back to us and say this state is doing this this works great or this works horrible, here's why. Um, and so we got to learn a lot through that. Um, we've run that internship now three different times. We didn't always have 18, um, but it was remote every time. Um, every time learning more about things that work. Um, our most recent internship, um, that was our summer group. Um, pretty cool stuff. We had them helping us to identify what we call life domain partners. Um, and so just like I explained with Spring Financial, they're financial experts. Um, who are the other companies out there that are doing cool stuff that we think should be connected with people who experience foster care? And so they, have, they basically had different areas they were focusing on. A lot were around housing and health. And they identified companies that if we could connect this company, it would make a huge impact. Um, and actually just this week, I had a call with one of the companies that they identified um, who's also a social enterprise, um, and they were so excited about the um, work that we're doing. Um, and it not only creates amazing conversations, but it creates these connections that then fuel into action that we've been talking about. Um, and so like one little example is um, at the end of the internship, we have a little gift we send to all of our interns. We send them a crock pot and a recipe book that is put together by our team. Because we're talking about these things, we're talking about housing and health and nutrition. Let's give them tools. And so I shared this with that group. Um, they're called Women's Bean Project. Um, for those of you who are familiar, they're out of Colorado. They make um, suits and a bunch of different things. Um, they have a workforce team that um, works with uh, women who are in transition in life. And so at the end of that call, they said, oh my gosh, well, we have to send a bunch of suits to your interns because they have these crop pots. They have to be able to make the suits. Um, and so that's just one example kind of of how these things, and that's just a start, you know, like turn into these next steps. Um, we're sending them an impact kit. So we have a lot of cool stuff going on. And that all stems from the work that these interns did. Um, knowing the things firsthand, knowing what I need, knowing what I want, and then also seeing this is the company that interests me. This is what really drives me and having them basically make lead us as we um, are developing. Um, we are really focused on um, this workforce development world now. And I think we're, right now we're taking a break from our remote internships, mostly because we're focused on purpose printery. We have a lot of cool in-house things going on with packouts, um, which we can talk about too. Um, but what's super interesting, and I think for me has been one of the biggest learnings is um, just because something works well, doesn't mean it's the best approach to take. And um, and I'll just, with the remote internship, say it works great. I mean, I think there was a lot of value. We got a ton out of it. But at the end of the day, the interns were all saying, we want to be there in person. We want to, we want to um, see you guys and interact with you. Um, 
And it was great because we got to work with people who didn't live geographically close to us. Um, but I really believe that the impact that we can have on that in-person experience, we can make a 5% change uh, virtually. That same thing could be a 50% change or 50 times more in person. So just because the remote stuff works, doesn't mean we can't do it better. Um, and so I think that's the direction with Purpose Printry that we're able to take and do now that we've learned so much, which is really, really exciting. Um, so I think I'll pause there and we can talk a little bit more about workforce development, Purpose Printry and all that good stuff. Yeah, so that's awesome, Colette. And I love how you said social entrepreneurship that you went into with so much expertise and other things, but to see the, the power of influence that that gives, which is what we're all about in this group of people is we all have that passion for that big impact. And so I really love you talking about how you came into it. Um, and just your comment about the it's what's good doesn't mean it's necessarily great or what you should continue doing um, as a primary focus is really important. As we talk about quite a bit, you know, being a, an alumni of foster care, being a foster kid myself, I totally get that in, in, in successful survivors and with Rhonda, you know, we're always talking about how important those relationships are and relationships are still about person to person connection, not face to face, though this is making something maybe out of nothing, it's still maybe not what we want and what they need. And so I just really, I just think that's a, a great asset of bringing to our information as we continue doing what we do in our communities of seeking those in that trauma informed approach of um, remembering that value of in-person um, communities. So, all right. Anybody have any questions or thoughts so far while they're talking about these and what they do? Um, one question I had while we're thinking, while you're raise your hand or let me know, put your little hand up if you have a question. And Mark, you look like maybe you do. I was wondering if they are required to have uh, identification to do this. And if so, what type of identification? I know that can be a barrier sometimes to those who've been in care. Yeah, um, and I can answer that. Um, so, Yes, and that it is a barrier. The, the reality is we have to do legally hire people. Um, and so we do require 18 and up. Um, there is some flexibility um, and we have been flexible at times than we need to as well. Um, but we'll work with them. I think one of my favorite stories about that is we hired an intern. She had her social security number, didn't have her card. Um, she had just moved um, basically three hours away, had just transferred to a new school. She had a ton going on um, and she didn't have time to go to the social security office, didn't have transportation. It was a big event. So for <clears throat> us, at the end of the day, the most valuable thing she could do during her internship with us was go get a replacement social security card. And so we got her a lift so she could get there, didn't have to spend her whole day going to, to and from. Um, and so I think that is, and she got it. And so we were good to go. Um, it doesn't always work that easily. I think we all know that. Um, but that is an example of just what, when the identification stuff comes up, like we're okay saying, look, this is the most important thing you need. We're going to help you get it. And we're going to be alongside you to help you figure out this stuff. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Dr. Mark Andrea, has, go, go ahead. I, I think Dr. An Andrea had a question. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just asking how we can best support your ministry. So I'm wondering, is it, is it getting, um, using your business? Um, do you receive donations? How can we support you um, the best way? Great question, Colette. You want to take that one? Sure. Um, there, there's a lot of answers to this one. Yes, <laughs> using, yes, using the business. I mean, Honestly, one thing we haven't talked much about is the um, pack out work that we do. So we've seen, especially as things have um, gone <laughs> virtual and remote, everyone's working from home. Um, companies are sending out these kits, employee engagement kits, things just to tell their people, like, we're thinking about you, we care about you. Um, and we've seen those types of kits skyrocket, which is incredible because it means that it creates jobs um, putting those kits together. So building boxes packing the boxes up, putting the shipping labels on. Um, I don't know as much of the industry terms on all that stuff, but basically we've been able to hire young people to help us do that. 
um, and create jobs there. So yes, when you buy things from us, it creates those types of opportunities. Um, as far as the foster greatness efforts go, there's a couple things that come to mind. Um, one is if you know of any community partners or any experts in the life domains, um, I'll write the life domains down in the chat um, so you can kind of get those wheels turning. But if you know of experts, we would love to be connected um, with anyone that you think would be um, beneficial for people who've experienced foster care. Um, one thing that I think we do kind of differently, especially with this, is we're also looking to connect groups that wouldn't necessarily work with people who experience foster care by design. Um, and we're kind of doing that intentionally because if we know there's something out there that works, a lot of times we just don't exercise that part of our brain to be like, oh, okay, well, this isn't for the foster community. Um, so therefore we wouldn't connect them. And we're saying, no, let's connect these things because if they've found a solution, we know what that solution is. Let's bring those things together. So if you know of companies, if you know of organizations, you know, people, we want to talk to them. Um, and then, yes, we do take donations. So Foster Greatness, um, it's kind of been in transition right now as an entity, um, but it is a fiscally sponsored project. Um, and so it's not a standalone nonprofit at this point, but it is connected um, to a nonprofit, which means we can take um, donations and we love them. Um, I think one of the most powerful things that I've seen um, that we're able to do with those donations is um, two things. Uh, get lifts to and from work and also provide lunch um, during the work days. Um, and so quick anecdotes about those things. Um, as we know, transportation is a big barrier. Um, in the last year, we've seen three people who were on our lift program um, go from getting lifts to buying their own car and now driving themselves mm -hmm. into work. So it's something that's not there today that should be and is a really helpful stepping stone um, and it helps save up so that they can buy a car. Um, and then also as far as lunches go, um, we, we work, um, we take a lunch break and those, that moment of lunch, um, and we've been talking to the people that work with us a lot. It goes a far way to show that we care. Um, and it's something as simple as food in the middle of the day. Um, but it's a good nourishing meal. It's time that we get to sit together. Um, and the 10, $12, whatever it is to get that lunch really makes an impact. Um, and so the, those are just a couple of like, little things that I think that's super uh, helpful. Yeah. Yes. Make a big difference. And we'll have L to talk little things are little but huge. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I have, a, I have an expert, you could say, <laughs> um, in the trauma and the, mm. the awesome. psychology. I'm a psychologist. So I would love to, after this, have some, uh, time with you guys talk about yeah, how I can support you. Oh, that's great. Oh, love now, see, that's love is action right there. I <laughs> love it. I love the connection. Beautiful. And Colette and Scott, what I'll say of Andrea is I've read her book about anxiety and I've also shared it with other people. It's amazing, especially I think for youngsters, but also in the professional world. Um, and the COVID crisis. And thank you. That's it right there. It's absolutely amazing because exactly like you guys are talking about in the workforce is you're giving takeaway skills, application skills. And that's what she does in the book too. It's not a read reader. It's an application reader. And that's beautiful for these kids. So thank you. Uh, young adults, I should say. <laughs> well, and you know, I, I teach classes and I would love to uh, volunteer my time to maybe do I'm in Southern California as well. So maybe we could mm. set up some classes or oh, we can, we can brainstorm. Hey, Andrea, while we're doing this on the side there, if you want to put your contact information sure. or Scott, if you want to maybe put yours and then we can coordinate, you yeah. guys could coordinate uh, contact. And Mark had a question earlier. Sorry, Mark, for the delay on that one. Um, well, yeah, my, my quest, the question was answered, which is great, which was just where is, uh, where is launch, uh, Purpose Printery based? Um, I will tell you quickly, I'm with Unity Care, which is an organization that helps uh, transition age youth, foster youth, get um, housing, mm -hmm. and mental and behavioral health support, mm -hmm. and substance use counseling. And uh, we are not as long on voced and training and job placement as we want to be. Um, so I'll put my, con my email in the chat there. Um, and uh, as you know, we're in the Bay Area principally in eight counties in, mm. in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
And as you uh, expand your, your, your fabulous, fabulous idea into the Bay Area, um, I hope you'll get in touch because we should, we would be, uh, we'd be very interested. Mm. Yeah, Mark, we'll, we'll be in touch in about 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> we, we operate around here. We actually acquired a company in mid mid COVID that was uh, operating in the city. Um, it was Ashbury Images. If okay. you're familiar with them, uh, they were a screen print business um, <clears throat> that were helping oper- opportunity youth. But uh, our model is a little bit different than theirs. And it, you know, as I explained, and part of part of the value that we we recognized in leveraging technology. And this is the value of the orders, right? So in purpose printery and, you know, um, we can segment the orders that come into our system directly to different geographies with different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, equipment, if you will. So we can do a labor component and move that to Southern California. We've got heat press equipment that I'm sitting in what was formerly our conference room, which is now our pack out and our print room. Um, but it's the value of that is it's really low cost for us um, capital investment and yeah. create significant opportunities. So it's it's a really easy model to replicate, um, even if it's just a good starting point um, to to introduce um, introduce your population to the how the work process works. Right. It's low cost from you know again making mistakes um, to learn from and yeah, to yeah. coach around. So lots. Uh, so would love to talk about that. And, and so, uh, actually literally my, my co-founder is on his way to Texas. Um, he's moving today, um, to uh-huh. get started. We've got some, some growth opportunities, um, in Texas and certainly the West coast is a big part of our growth initiative. Getting back to San Francisco is very important to us, Sweet. Uh, a big client base. So we'll, we'll chat. Sweet. Uh, for the record, I put some stuff in the chat there, and uh, and thank you, Scott. I look forward to that, and, and anyone else who um, uh, sees some potential point of connection. Thank you. And, thank and Mark, you. since you wrote that on there, just in case somebody's listening and can't see it, could you just tell us um, who you are and what you represent there? Oh yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, so I'm with Unity Care, and I described what we do uh, a minute ago, uh, and we're based in the Greater Bay Area, and I'm on the board, and uh, just keenly awesome. interested in in uh, fostering connections. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I wanted to just uh, chime in a second. I put it in the chat, but I wanted to say it out loud too that um, you know, Love Is Action is an initiative of the Successful Survivors Foundation. And we're um, putting together uh, an offering for uh, victims of childhood trauma that that will have a a private group and it will be led um, by Amber and myself, both uh, victims of childhood trauma, but successful survivors Mm -hmm. of it, Mm -hmm. uh, having mined the lessons uh, that we learned out of our experiences. And, uh, and using those things for good. And so really it's the fulfillment of Romans 8, 28, as far as I'm concerned, God working all things together for good. And so um, I just wanted to, to throw that out there that you know anybody who's been through any kind of childhood trauma um, is, is welcome to join us. And not that we don't love our allies, we absolutely do. But this is uh, this is a trauma informed thing that um, you know. I think I think a lot of um, victims of childhood trauma respond to specifically because you know because it's led by us. Mm-hmm. And I love that Colette and Scott that you both kind of aired into what Rhonda was just talking about. You know, some of these kids they have such. Uh, emotional barriers that it's, it limits them to reach reach their full capacity that they are capable of. And so even organizations like yours, being able to collaborate with all these other ones like successful survivors, where we can help with some of those emotional aspects and um, fulfillment of, of their ability to work. And then you guys get in there and provide those basic skills of the application workforce. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's, that's the joy of collaboration and love is actions. Okay, so I have a question. How are we doing on time? We're okay. Yeah, 10 minutes. Okay, so this is a question for you, Scott. Um, 
I would love to have you speak directly to um, business people who may view this video in the future. Mm. Um, what advice would you give to someone who says, okay, well, I have this business, I care about kids, I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure you know, how, to, how to do this. I'm, I'm aware that I could do more harm than good if I'm not careful. And you know, what advice do you have to, for that person? Boy, Rhonda, I think that the, the single most impactful um, change that, that I've experienced in, in moving from that business world into the social enterprise space is really one around the trauma-informed. And, and I would encourage um, everyone to dig into the, those, those traumas, um, both personally as well, as because that is, that is the culture component that, that everyone is searching for. It is about building good teams, is about get, building good relationships within the walls of the business. And I would tell you that what we've seen, Rhonda, is because we have a, a unifying objective in, in being a purpose-driven business, that culture that is, is created because of that greater purpose and the empathy that we come to the office with, again, we're, we're all equal here, um, creates an amazing bottom line outcome. Hmm. It's, it's not a, it's not a, if, or it really is. It's the, and, and it's the way that we should be starting our businesses because we're all trying to figure out how to create that culture of caring and bringing folks together to care about the outcome. Um, it, it, it was probably three years ago when I had that aha moment, like, Oh, this is where we should have started. This is, this is unbelievably powerful and, and which honestly allows us the growth rate that we're at, right? So we've been, we, we've made the Inc. 5000 list is the fastest growing company in the United States the last three years running. Wow. Um, and that's the, and a lot of the accolades and, you know, we were recognized as in the real impact leaders and recognized in. Um, you know, the, the 50 most civic minded companies in Orange County, all of those things are, are neatly important because they give us um, confirmation that we're doing the right things. And, 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 and the way that you can run a really good business and, and we, that, that, that's the business imperative and spend a significant amount of time, energy, and effort listening Right to the to the to the folks that you want around you. Ours happens to be listening to the mission population, but if we do that in no, normal business, you can you can do both. You can have a, a significant impact, and it does it truly changes at the generational level. Scott, that's amazing. And so, what I hear you say is, um, or you know, the Rhonda paraphrased version of what I hear you say is. This is not a little side initiative. This is the whole enchilada. Yes, ma'am. Hundred percent. And 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 you know, and again, our, our so so the play, the pun, as we started this morning with right, doing good works, doing good works. It it does it does you know, and and I just have to I just have to add for those business people out there who might uh, think, eh, well, I don't know about that. Let me just say there are an estimated 12 million former foster kids in the United States. Mm. And Pew Foundation estimates that, that, that the number of people walking around among us, so our coworkers, our employees, our clients, uh, the estimated number of people who experienced childhood trauma is three times that number. So 36 mm -hmm. million people in the United States who experience childhood trauma. We're everywhere. Yes. So I love that you talk about a trauma-informed approach. That's, that yeah. has got to be key in business. 100%. 
I was yeah. at a conference recently where they were, uh, there was a lady who was doing some missionary service and she was talking about how she had lived what she perceived as a great life without trauma influence in it and didn't feel equipped to be even in the same room with me and some of the people in the room. And I told her, I said, you are the people we need to see the other side, to open our eyes to what we don't know and help us build the bridge between the two, build the empathy and compassion that you guys are talking about and to carry that into our works, but also on people like Rhonda and I who are from foster care to see there is the other side for that intergenerational change. And so it makes me think of exactly what you're talking about, how both ends of the spectrum are, are essential and influential. We got um, about five minutes, but a couple minutes of it, I just want to do a summary of Love is Action. So Scott and Colette, I'm going to give you a couple minutes if there's anything else you want to say or note to today. I I just want to say, yeah, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. And and it is such a a pleasure to to be here and and obviously to be um, alongside with Rhonda for, for the seven years that we've, we've known each other and, and the success that, uh, that we've both collectively have, have garnered in this space. Uh, and so to be here on, on this program and with you guys and, and be thought of in, in the same space as love is action um, is, is pretty special. So, so thank you for the opportunity. Oh, we're so blessed that you're here and, and, and putting your love into action. What a great role model you are. Yes. May I just say one quick thing? I just want to also say how grateful I am that you guys are are using a trauma informed uh, approach because you know it makes all the difference in the world to be able and all of us need it whether we're in business or not or just interacting with with people when we have that sense of uh, where people have been. And, 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 and we know what's happening because we have some information on trauma, what could be happening inside of people, we can love them so much better. Mm-hmm. We can heal them so much better. And when we can heal and love people, we're, we're not just changing the world, but we're changing our businesses, right? Because you're going to have much better success. They're going to be more successful. There's going to be better relationships. I mean, it's just, it's this huge snowball effect. And I just love that you have a company that um, is sensitive to that. I think that's absolutely beautiful. So for uh, Love is Action, Rhonda, were you going to say something? No, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, We are so, so grateful that you guys came. We hope that people are able to follow up. We're excited to see where it goes from here. Please let us know at Successful Survivors as in our Love is Action initiative, we'll keep sending that out and collaboration. Uh, Miss Andrea is going to be our speaker next month. And so we're going to be talking about uh, some of those components we mentioned that can also be essential to your employees. Uh, us as adults, those from hard places, I think any spectrum of the world, especially today, she's got the knowledge and uh, the the wisdom to share. So please share that. Um, Love is Action, you can follow us on Facebook. You can also check our website. And I'm thankful for everybody. And Miss Rhonda, did you have anything else? No, I just wanted to thank everybody. I love what you're doing. I think this is, um, it's, it's exactly um what everybody needs to hear is real examples of putting our love into action i know that it's not always easy and so um you guys make it sound and look so good and easy but i know that when we're dealing with people who have been harmed it can get messy and it can be really difficult and um the, the, the most beautiful thing that we can do is put our love into action with, um, uh, with, with people who are hurting and are uh, either cannot or will not reciprocate. Um, that's, that's really, that's, that's when love becomes hard, but that's when love is, I think, the most rewarding and the most healing. So thank you for doing that. We will be looking forward to some awesome stories and wishing and praying for your best, everybody's best, and thankful for everybody who's able to um, watch this video now or in the future. So great things coming soon and continued prayers. Everybody have a great day. Scott and Colette, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Have a great day.